Hello, and welcome to an episode of Superpowers, the show where you have the opportunity to experience the extraordinary. And today I have a great guest. I have David Bennett. And David is a near-death experiencer, um, as well as he's had some other spiritually transformational experiences that we'll talk about today, um, all of which have led him to now becoming um, a, a healer as well as a life coach and uh, all very positive things that have, that have come out of this for him and uh, so we'll get a chance to share that with him um, I want to talk real quick just for a minute uh, we've got uh, Dave will also be a speaker at our uh, Academy for Spiritual and Consciousness Studies event coming up starting on Thursday this week and if you um, I uh, haven't got tickets for that yet. Uh, it would be a great thing to do. The event is going to be quite extraordinary, actually, and there's going to be amazing speakers there, and it will be near-death experiences, and it's going to be mediums, and it's going to be uh, people uh, who are just kind of breaking down and talking about the nature of consciousness. And I think, uh, you know, as we continue moving in these adventures of consciousness that we've been having, the, the more we understand that, the better we understand that, the more we understand ourselves and the nature of our personal realities so um, if you if you can do it it would be great uh, we'd love to have you on the live stream if you can't make it for the live stream uh, we will also have video on demand of the event so it's a great opportunity to hear some some people who've had some amazing experiences that will open doors of possibility for you as well as give you some ideas then of what to do with all that now so and uh, that's actually a really good segue to move into Dave because that's uh, precisely what Dave has done. So uh, I want to just jump in and say hello to Dave Bennett. Hey, Dave, how are you? Hey, Carl. I'm excited to be here today. Thanks. Yeah, well, I'm totally excited to have you, and I'm really excited uh, about your uh, talk at the uh, at the Academy for Spiritual and Consciousness Studies event coming up. And um, I want to I just sort of introduce you a little bit to our audience, and you know, just kind of give them a little bit more of an idea uh, um, about your journey, you know, and what some of those stepping stones were that got you to uh, this point where you are now today sure sure um well back in the early 80s i was uh, a chief engineer on a research vessel so i was very uh very analytical in the way that i thought of things black and white was pretty much my life and um but that's the way you're trained to think as an engineer and so but then i had an experience uh, a near-death experience in 83 where i died i drowned in an accident offshore and it changed my whole world view. I mean, it just, it, it, but at, in 83, there weren't a lot of people that you could share it with. So, and I lived my life at sea, about nine months of the year I was at sea. So very isolated from uh, local community, local, you know, what's going on kind of thing. You know, we didn't have the, the type of services on board uh, that you have on board ship today, you know. Right. We didn't have internet, anything like that. So we yeah. were pretty isolated. And I couldn't talk about death or dying or that subject with my shipmates because we, we did underwater exploration and research. Mm -hmm. And we put each other's lives in each other's hands every day. So death was kind of a taboo subject. So right. I had to kind of internalize this whole experience for almost 11 years. And um, 11 years later, I had a second experience, uh, very much like the first one. And, and that really just shook my world. It said, you know, you just can't be uh, an island of your own. You have to live in this world and you have to be, you know, live in your truth and right. share who you really are. And this experience showed me who I really was. Yeah. And so with that, I was, I, it, it kind of catapulted me into more of the spiritual, my spiritual nature. I started exploring it much deeper. Mm-hmm. And, and I grew from that, and I, I developed what I called my quiet ministry for a while. Because of that 11 <laughs> years of isolation, you know, I, I became quite uh, good at hiding, you know, this spiritual 
core of my being that I had, you know, started to develop and work with and the intuitive knowings that I had developed and things like that. And then, you know, and then eventually I, after working with it, I was able to actually, you know, now I hear spirit. Spirit speaks to me very clearly. Mm-hmm. I, my direction is very clear now because I've, I've worked with it. It's like exercise. The more you work right. with it, the clearer it becomes, you know. Yeah. And that's... Uh, and, and that helped me to kind of, you know, it, it, I shifted gears. I left my life at sea. I started, I, I felt like I had this calling to be more of service, you know. And that's pretty common for a lot of experiencers. So I went into healthcare because I felt like I could do more in, in healthcare. And I became uh, the manager, assistant director of dialysis services in, at St. Joseph's Hospital in Syracuse, New York. And that really, um, I, I felt like I had a, you know, some work to do there. And mm-hmm. I did for a number of years. I really was able to kind of add my um, add my assistance in developing new technologies and things for that modality. Right. So it really I really felt like I was being of service at there. But then things I, I felt like I needed, you know, I was being directed that there was more change that I could I could do. There was more that I could do uh, you know, and it was and it was coming up. Well in my near death experience, I had seen not only my life review, but I'd seen a lot of my future life. And mm-hmm. in that future life, I saw I was going to have cancer. And I saw I was going to have, you know, but I also saw I was going to live beyond the cancer. Well, in 2000, I was sitting in my office and all of a sudden my back felt like it exploded. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I wa- actually walked uh, kind of in a daze. I walked up to the emergency department and, um, and and I found out that I had stage four lung cancer that had metastasized into my spine. It ate away uh, two and a half bones in my thoracic, and it, my spine actually collapsed because the tumor could no longer support the weight of my spine. And uh, and so I you know I immediately recognized it from my experience you know mm-hmm. in the light, right. and I knew that this was something that I had to go through. I immediately accepted it. Of course, everybody thought I was in denial because they, they all thought I was dying because the doctors uh-huh. had given me, you know, six to eight weeks to, to, to live, pretty much get your affairs in order. There's nothing we can do for you. Right. And, um, and I said, no, no, I'm going to survive this. They, of course, they thought I was in denial, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was one of everybody those Everybody situa- starts off on the positive thinking road. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you know. Um, but I was able to, um, and through spirit guidance and everything, I was able to... Um, develop my own kind of healing modality in order to overcome this cancer. And I, and I, I, and I've supplemented it with traditional medicine as well. Uh, you know, I had the radiation and the chemo. Um, and fortunately I was, uh, a manager in the, in the hospital. So I was able to pick my healthcare team, which was, that was nice. Yeah. Um, and, and they, they kind of were uh, a little patronizing in the fact that, you know, they, they really thought I was dying. Right. And they, and they felt that it was a little invasive to do all of this that I wanted. But I was the patient. My patient writes, I can do what I want, you know. And so they, but they, so they treated me, but um, a little reluctantly at first. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then at six months out, I, I, my, my guidance was, you know, that things were getting better and I finally got them to test it. And when they did, it found that I was cancer free. So wow. within six months, I was able to, you know, turn the cancer diagnosis around. I still had to live with a broken spine for a while, you know, almost a year, year and a half before they would, because they still thought I was going to die any minute. But that was their <laughs> reality. It wasn't mine. And, um, and, and I, uh, you know, but I was able to, uh, finally get some surgeries to uh, stabilize my spine and and uh, here I am today right. but what all those experiences did for me was they they taught me all the way along you know that spiritual growth element uh, the quiet ministry all of that it, I was I learned that that there you know we have within us the ability to connect and that our consciousness, and that's why I'm kind of excited about this conference, is because we're we're going to be talking about consciousness, and not not just you know the way we feel that it's in our mind, but the non-local consciousness, how we right. receive consciousness, you know. Yeah. And that's what's exciting to me because we are able to do a lot more. And it, it led me once the cancer, um, I, I I quit my life. Uh, 
in, in the healthcare, you know, traditional healthcare, and I began doing some energetic healing. And also, um, I do a lot of what I call transformational life coaching because I work with a lot of experiencers, people that have had all types of spiritually transformative experiences. Um, there's nothing really out there to help them in the integration process mm -hmm. because there's an integration time after you've had an experience like this that you come back and you're like, what do I do with this? Right. You know? It's like exactly. I had this phenomenal experience. Maybe many times it feels otherworldly, and then you know now I'm back in in this life, and um, what do, you know where do I go from here? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where my you know transformational coaching can help sometimes. You know to help help you discover what is your path because I I struggled. Oh, you can tell. I mean, my it was a long journey for me to get to where I am now. Right. Yeah, but but you did get there, and you did uh, you did take. Uh, what uh, had come from those experiences, and you've really turned it into a, into a positive. Uh, I would like to revisit something that you you mentioned because after the second one, that's when you said, you know, I'm really going to have to start being who I am. I, I can't just kind of keep this all tucked inside. Um, so I imagine that was sort of the beginning of a journey. Um, but then the other thing that you mentioned too was that you had have gotten to a point where you now hear communication very clearly so i'd love to know how you got to that point and then i would also like to know um if we remember all this <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. um, uh how you discern that communication from just internal dialogue and and that sort of thing but especially the the process of getting yourself there because i know a lot of people are walking this path and they would you know it's just nice to know what somebody else did you know on their journey sure you know um <clears throat> Back, back when I had my first experience, I didn't, I, I, I'd never heard anything about near-death experiences. I didn't know what it was. I, I didn't even know the term. And it wasn't until the 11 years later, after I had the second experience, that I ran into someone who actually used that term when I started to share what I had had. had. And I think that's the, the starting point, is, is being able to share your experience with someone who is just going to listen. Mm -hmm. They're not going to judge it. They're right. not going to try to tell you what your experience was. They're just going to listen to you and allow you to get it out, you know. Right. And, and, and then maybe writing it down because when you revisit, when you start to explore your experience, the memories will start to come back and it will be a much richer um, experience for you. And the way I developed that communication was it, – it's kind of interesting – if you think for a minute about, um, we all have something in life that, that we feel we use as our creative nature, okay, mm -hmm. where we kind of, we get that inspiration. Well, inspiration is spirit communication. I mean, where do you think it comes from, right? <laughs> right, yeah. It's coming yeah. from your higher consciousness. It's coming from your, your light. It's coming mm -hmm. from your connection to that unity, that oneness, whatever that universal consciousness is. That's your stream. That's your connection to, to it. Is inspiration a lot of times is the first uh, the, 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 some of the first uh, communication that we recognize. Mm -hmm. So what I, and I, I, I saw that very clearly that I, because at that point I was getting these intuitive knowings that, and I was an engineer and I didn't know what to do with these intuitive knowings because it right. wasn't anything I'd learned. It wasn't anything that I had, had, you know, uh, experienced in life. It wasn't anything I'd, I'd studied in school. So, you know, where is this information coming from? Is it veridical? Is it something I can rely on? And so I would, what any good engineer would do, I tested it, you know, and I would make sure, is this, it's reliable? Is mm -hmm. it something that's truth? And um, it helped me in, in becoming accepting of it, because I think we have to get to a point of acceptance that, that there is this communication available to us. Right. And once I accepted it, then it was like, well, how can I, you know, because it seemed intermittent to me. It didn't mm -hmm. seem like a constant flow of, uh, of information. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that it, it didn't feel as reliable as I would have liked it to be. So then right. I started using my creativity. And me, I use silversmithing. I, I, I didn't know anything about silversmithing, but it was something I was 
drawn to. It felt like maybe it was something from a prior life. I don't know. But it, it just felt like I was being drawn to, the, to doing some silversmithing work. And so I started working with it. I didn't read any books. I didn't do anything. I just started going into it and allowing inspiration to kind of help and guide me through. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was able to start to discern what was, you know, the monkey mind and right. what was spirit communication. Right. And so by using my inspiration, I was able to recognize that when I, when I, when I feel it, and, and I've talked to some other people about this, um, I actually get a physical sensation a lot of times along with spiritual communication. Mm. Um, so for me, it feels like my heart's kind of expanding. You know? ah. I feel that's what it kind of feels like. For I know, I know some people, some other healer friends of mine, they feel it in their hands. Their palms will get warm. Right. The, the crown of their head will feel like there's like this fuzzy feeling there or something mm -hmm. like that. So a lot of people will get a, a sensation along with it. Not necessarily. I mean, it's not something that you absolutely have to. But, but another key that I found in the discerning was it's never judgmental. It's never criticized. It never, mm. you know, it, it's very matter of fact. It's very on point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I mean, that's a good way to tell the difference because our mind, our normal chattery mind that's always busy, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's always judging this. It's always weighing this against that, that sort of thing, you know? Right. And, right. and that doesn't exist with spirit communication. It's yeah. very, like I said, matter of fact, to the point, and it, it doesn't hold judgment. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of love that's attached to it. And there, sometimes there's a lot of humor, too, because I argue with spirit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because spirit wants me to do things sometimes that I don't feel like I'm ready. So I will pl make a game out of it sometimes and try to, you know, see if I can put it off. You know? Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, that, I used to do that a lot more in the past. Not so much anymore, because mm. I, I've come to learn that it's in my best interest to, to pretty much follow what spirit. Where spirit right. Is. Yeah. I have noticed uh, that a tool that I can use, it's a parallel track to your silversmithing nuts, but I get out on my bike and I ride my mm. bike. And at first, you know, the, it takes a second for the, for the monkey mind, as you say, I like that term, uh, to, to settle down and go away and be more focused on the physical activity, you know. And then once, once it's sort of focused on that, I, I just use it to think because I'm a writer, you know, so I use it mm -hmm. for um, ideas. I, I use it for, uh, for streaming for the soul ideas, um, you know, and uh, it's it, – and I know what you mean about it, it's funny because I'm kind of searching for what how to discern that voice myself, you know, and I and I have to say that the most clarity I get and the most on point things I get are when I'm out and I'm riding around on my bike. It's that second wind. I, I used to be a jogger before I blew my knees out because um, uh, as commercial divers, we used to we had to stay in really good physical condition mm -hmm. and stuff. Right. So I used to work out a lot and I I still like to work out, but uh, I just not the same as I used to. Right. Um, but but that second wind is a sense of clarity. I know exactly what you're talking about. Right. Once, you know, once you get into that physical exertion, a lot of times you'll get this sense of clarity that comes, comes to you. That's right. a great way uh, yeah. to connect. Another one is of course, meditation. I mean, that's the yes. one that most people are going to say right off the bat is mm -hmm. meditation. Yeah. Um, but I, I like to use inspiration because we've all had inspiration, you know, and we right. know that. And that's, wow, there's something. Now, let's look back on that. Well, how did that affect me? What did it feel like when I was experiencing that, that yeah. sort of thing? Yeah. But I use meditation. I meditate every morning. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually set time aside for spirit communication in my morning. Before I start my day, right. I have a period of where I, I, do, I go through gratitude. That's what takes me into mm. a space of uh, peace. Right. And because there's something in gratitude that expands our awareness. When we're grateful, our awareness naturally just releases and expands. Right. And so um, with that, then I go into uh, contemplation. I've written a book about contemplation, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. just, it just came out a year or so ago with uh, Findhorn. Right. But, um, but uh, contemplation, I get, then I'm able to have actual spirit communication and, and share that, you know, 
And I, and I throw that I, every morning. I throw um, whatever spirit communication I have that morning. I throw it out on the web on my uh, Facebook page and on my Twitter, and on my Twitter feed. You know, uh-huh. so it's, right. it's kind of fun. And you know? share it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I share it. Yeah. That's well, and, and uh, so many different places will really emphasize, even if it's five minutes in the morning, if that's how you start your day, versus what I know is a very easy thing to do, which is, you know, turn on your computer or look at your phone or something like that. And, and you just start on, you know, running that wheel. But if you just take five minutes and do even what you said, just find a place of gratitude, the, the tenor of your day would be so much different. And how you receive then the events of the day would be very different than, yeah. um, it helps us out uh, phys- physiologically as well because when I um, I first started it when I after my spine collapsed um, mm-hmm. I had to, fi- to find a way to manage the pain right and so um, I used meditation to heighten my mindfulness so that I could kind of take the pain and actually set it aside it's kind of right. like you put it in a bubble and set it aside uh-huh. and so it's yeah. there it's there to remind you when um, you know when when you're being a guy and you're doing dumb things like I do all the time. Um, <laughs> oh, so but, like all the time. <laughs> yeah, like all the time. Yeah, but um, but it's there to help us. But it's um, it, it. But you're able to. But you know, because I because of my spine and because of the surgeries, I live with pain all the time. Mm-hmm. So I started my morning meditation as a technique to kind of get my pain under control so that I could live my life. Right. And so meditation. Um, helps you with, you know, developing that mindfulness. And I noticed the same as you. The, when I started to do it every morning at the start of my day, then it seemed like my day went a lot smoother. It was like mm-hmm. I was putting that first foot out in a very respectful and mindful way, and the and it carried over into my day. And yeah, that's a I don't know. It's a that's a byproduct from morning meditation that I just I, I love. Yeah. Okay, so so you you went through this process and you really have now established a nice connection and the the byproducts of that are even more than than your personal benefit because um, you mentioned that uh, part of what you're doing in addition to life coaching is that you also now are working on uh, with with healing certain elements of people's lives. I'd love to know just a little bit more about that and how you work and and what that process is like sure sure um i really believe that um healing and coaching both are um i call it multi-faceted and a two-way street um mm-hmm. <laughs> and what i mean by that is multifaceted is uh, you have to look at all healing and all coaching from um uh, your mental your emotional your physical and your spiritual Mm-hmm. Because in order to move forward in any aspect of life, all of those have to be in alignment. Mm-hmm. They all have to be at least on the same frequency. Right. So I try to, I work with people before I even, before I do any even energetic healing, before anybody goes on the table, um, we're, we'll sit down and we'll talk because um, I also believe that all, um, all, all healing and coaching has to be done in this moment. So I want to know where you are at this moment, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna we're gonna talk and we're gonna share a few things and we're gonna we're gonna look at you know what is your desire? What is your deep desire? Not not the desire that well, I'd like to have enough money to buy a new Maserati, um, <laughs> but but more a deeper desire. Like what is it that you're trying to attain within your your being, you know, like, is it, is it you're looking for inner peace? Is it you're looking to be more of service? What are, what are those deep, really needs and wants and desires that you have? And then yeah. let's explore where do we go from there? Right. But, and, you know, so then the healing, my healing is a little, is a little different. Um, it's very much like a, a healing touch a, or a Reiki or something like that. But what I do is I connect um, while talking to someone like, like I'm talking to you right now, I get a feel for your essence. And so once I get you on the table, then what I do is I go back into the light because I, I've developed that doorway to be able to go back into the light. 
and I connect with your essence. Mm -hmm. And then your essence actually guides me and, and I bring your light through to help amplify your healing and your energy and that sort of thing. And in coaching, and, and also in the two-way street, I, know I didn't explain the two-way street. The two-way street is um, healing and in coaching. Um, I mean, I'm going to do what I can to help facilitate you know, what you, your needs are. Right. But also, either through energy work or through coaching, but also, you know, the client, it's not, you know, they have a job too, uh -huh. okay? And so what I do when, when I have someone on the table, I usually give them a, uh, maybe a Sanskrit mantra or some breath work to, so that they maintain that open vessel within themselves. Right. And then in coaching... I believe, I firmly believe that pretty, all clients have to be accountable. You know, from one coaching session to the next, you know, we're going to talk and we're going to see how did, how did what we learned at the last session, how has it played out in your life between sessions, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I look for that accountability. So that helps them also to be mindful of what it is that they learned in that session and try to bring it to play into their life, you know, because right. it's one thing to learn about all these great wonderful things that a lot of these teachers have for 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 all of us but it's another thing to bring it to play you know right. to put it into action bring it into your life exactly. make it a part of your reality you know because that's when then then it's going to start to manifest all those good things that you want in life mm -hmm. but you have to you have to put it into action you know? right yeah so tell me a little about um, how you do that you have said you mentioned um, uh, before you put some on the table. So obviously you see people in person. Um, do I also you do, do th distance work too. But. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Do you do distance work and, and, um, and do you do any sort of group stuff too? Or um, how does all this manifest for you? <laughs> Yeah, I do group stuff too because I'm, in fact at the conference I'm going to I'm going to do uh one of the workshops I'm going to do a, a kind of a work uh a group type workshop where we um uh helping uh, like if you were going to have an experiencer group help help them. And um but right now I don't have any groups. I just relocated here to Virginia Beach, so I I don't have a group down here that I work with at this time that may be something in the future here right. but um but i did work when i lived in central new york i i, I had a an experiencer group anybody who'd had any kind of spiritually transformative experience was welcome to come to this group mm -hmm. and um and there it's kind of interesting i would act as a facilitator mm -hmm. and and that's kind of what i'm going to teach in this workshop is how to be a good facilitator to be able to work with experiencers because experiencers have a unique set of needs you know and 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 i'm going to talk about that and that sort of thing right. but what i would do as a facilitator is, is a facilitator isn't a leader he's just there to help the group to reach certain goals or certain outcomes what and you spell right. that out at the beginning yeah. but um but what i'm going to uh try to help with is, um, is, is to help for create some experiencer groups because uh, there, there's so many experiencers out there that are looking for a place to go because it's great to connect with people online, mm -hmm. but it's a whole nother experience to connect in person with other oh, yeah. experiencers. Yeah. You know, to be in that presence, to share each other's energy, um, that, it's an element that you just can experience online right. um maybe maybe vr will help us there i don't know but, um, <laughs> but right now it, it, i don't i don't i just i haven't it's not the same as being in person with other experiencers and and sharing in a group type format it's very powerful yeah well um, i understand that too from the ions conferences that's exactly. probably my favorite room to be in of any room that where i've live streamed um just uh, it's kind of indescribable what it feels like to be in a room with, uh, you know, 50 to 100 people who have had a near-death experience. Yeah, 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 that's, uh, you know, and, and when, you, when you start to see them break out into their little lunch groups and dinner groups and stuff, mm -hmm. there's all this sharing going on. Right. I mean, that's, that's where a lot of the real work at these conferences happens is, is, is in the behind-the-scenes type of things, you know. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely.
your um, contemplative book that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, what what's the title of that book? Oh, and how do you how do you work with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, Gosh, you would ask me the title. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I am terrible with names. Names is one of my real pitfalls in this life. Um, it's, uh, gosh, it just totally went out of my head. My own book. I can imagine yeah. that. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> anyway, anyway. Yeah. But, okay, so, well, the title probably is less important than just knowing um so i i'm just curious how you work with that is it is it like a, a maybe what similar to like what a an affirmation book would be like for somebody yeah, to read it's, or it's that pretty, kind of thing pretty similar it mm -hmm. what it is what it is is i i broke it up into 44 chapters and there's four contemplations for each chapter mm -hmm. so the um and what it is is you can use the contemplations in the book to, um, and, and now the title, of course, pops into my head. The title is A Voice as Old as Time, uh, Contemplations for Spiritual Development. Right. So, um, so what you do is, is like, so right now uh, we mentioned like developing peace in, uh -huh. in our life. So, so maybe that's where you want to be. So that's, let's contemplate on that. Okay. Because contemplation, it's, it's where you're in, it's a different form of meditation in, in many meditation techniques. They're trying to teach, uh, to clear the mind. Okay. Right. right. And that is very frustrating for a lot of people, yes. especially <laughs> engineer types like me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to so, figure out the math yeah, on, exactly but, on how you clear you know, the mind you know? and, 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 and most of the time you really don't achieve that absolute um you know that absolute stillness mm -hmm. there's always a little bit of something going on right. and we're easily distracted so True. what i like to do is i like to reach that center of peace like i said with gratitude mm -hmm. and that and then in, when i when i find that calm that calm center within myself. Then I start, then I pose a specific thought and allow that thought to grow on its own. And then a lot of times my spiritual guidance then will start to kick in and, and help, um, you know, expand that thought and maybe explore it even deeper. Right. Um, and so in my book, what I've done is I've set up different, like I said, 44 different subjects Mm -hmm. that um, you can use those as jumping off points right? to maybe read. And each page is its own contemplation. But within each page, there's actually kind of an archetypical flow that I've tried to develop um, that allows you to, um, you can just take a sentence or a paragraph. You know, many pages have maybe three paragraphs on them. Right. And, and so you can just take a sentence and you can work on that for a day. Mm -hmm. You can work on that for a week. Right. Sometimes you may want to need to work on that one for, you know, a longer time, but yeah. that's okay. You know, I mean, you, it, we're all on these paths and, and we're all, you know, and, and we're all working on it at our own pace. Right. So, you know, this is a self, self paced type of book and you can use it in a lot of different ways. Other people that have read the book say they use it kind of like as a bibliography where they just open the book up and they just land on a page and they say, oh, that's exactly what I need right now. Right. And that's allowing the universe to kind of guide you, you know, in that mm -hmm. sort of. So there's a lot of ways you can use the book, um, but it's meant to be kind of just a, just a, uh, an aid in, in helping to develop a, a contemplative way of living. Right. Um, so here's a question for the, the engineer in you. Because... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, because I'm just wondering, um, I mean, engineering inherent in that is, uh, uh, you know, understanding, figuring out ways that 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 things go together. That's that's one element of it. Um, so uh, I wonder now, um, because I'm loving this discussion that is finally up from a science standpoint about that consciousness creates sure. form versus, you know, the other way around. Um, that's something that I was introduced to, 
you know, many years ago when I read uh, um, Seth Speaks, the the book channeled by Jane Roberts, yeah. and um, which that was probably a spiritually transformative experience for me because once that's you know that's the tree growing a ring that you can't ungrow. You start looking yeah. at things that way, and that's just how you look at. It. But I'm just curious now because of your science mind and what's going on in the in the quantum electrodynamics world, just um, you know, uh, if you're having fun with that at all. <laughs> yes, actually. Yeah. I, I enjoy, um, I like at this conference where, you know, they're going to explore, you know, consciousness, you know, and, and right. I think the big question that a lot of people are, um, are exploring these days is where does consciousness reside? You know? mm -hmm. Cause I believe, um, that, you know, like our mind is just one receiver. We also have our heart, Mm -hmm. We also have huh. in our gut that 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 uh, bundle of uh, ganglia down there that right. um, that all receive, and so some receive, um, and they and they receive in different ways. And I mm -hmm. think the information that they receive, it's very much like uh, um, Eastern the the chakra system, you know, where right. each chakra has a, a certain element. And when energy comes into our 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 field. It's processed by all these different energy centers because, you know, each one controls a different element. Right. Well, I really believe that our mind, our heart, and our gut tend to process different input, let's call right. it input, yeah. um, of consciousness of, um, differently so that we can then react on it. Mm -hmm. And so I really, you know, and, and that's that melding of non-local consciousness with physical reality. You know, right. And that's and I think that that's kind of what this conference really is, is exploring in a lot of different yeah. ways. Yeah. And so I get excited about that. Anytime I can learn from someone who's who's, you know, doing research on that. Right. I've read a lot of Pin Von Lommel's work because um, he worked with a lot of near death experiencers. And mm -hmm. I've been involved. I've been um, I've been one of the test subjects in a number of near death uh, studies over the years. So. Um, so I, I, I tend to listen to a lot of the researchers that, that use uh, near-death experiences to explore that sort of thing. And Dr. Pim von Lommel's done a lot of work in, in non-local consciousness. And I, I, I just, you know, I can't get enough of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know that we'll be be hearing more about that, uh, you know, this week at the uh, at the uh, conference. Um, and I'm excited about that. You know, I'm actually really glad that you said what you did, too, which was um, mentioning that we have different receivers because I know even a lot of times when I'm just asking my questions about what somebody's experience is like and how they're discerning it, I'm thinking of, you know, like voice type stuff, or I'm thinking about maybe visualization. It's all sort of the up here part of, of me, and, um, and I'm not really thinking about how my heart is receiving something or my gut, which I know are good receivers. Yeah, I, I mean, you can feel that stuff, um, yep. you know, pretty well, pretty unequivocally, and uh, you know when that feels good or when that doesn't feel good yeah exactly and when you can uh, achieve a um a, sen a sense of balance and this is where like mindfulness uh, really comes in i think when i started to have to start to learn how to live um you know setting the pain aside and stuff like that it's very it's it, it, it sets you on a path of mindfulness and mm -hmm. so i've been trying to live in the present being as mindful as possible as to you know what's going on in my surroundings around me, but that also affects how I feel every given yeah. moment. Because right. another thing that happened when I when my spine collapses, I can't feel my hands or my feet. Well, most of us when we walk, we use our toes for balance. Mm. Right. Well, my toes don't exist in my reality; mm. they're just not there. Right. So I have to use the pressure of my ankle. Um, to tell me where I am, but it doesn't give me my forward and back kind of balance. So I have to be very mindful and present whenever I'm walking or standing and, and doing anything. I have to, be, have, to have that sense of, of, of presence. Right. So it's interesting by just naturally I had to develop that. Um, I started to become aware of where I was feeling this, this, you know, what's coming to me, 
Mm-hmm. I, you know, so where, you know, like listening to my heart. So I call it listening to my heart because a lot of times, you know, we listen to our mind. Well, that's great for the engineer side of me. And we need that for reasoning and that sort of thing. Sure. But sometimes, um, you know, and, and after a near death experience, a lot of experiences become very empathic. Well, you hear that through your heart more mm. than you do your mind. Right. And so yeah. then where does this information come from? And then balancing them out so that I'm I am listening to my heart and my mind at the same time. And right. then when I get those gut reactions, a lot of times those are the ones that like, OK, somebody's coming into my space that mm, I may not necessarily agree with their path in life. OK, right. <laughs> but that's OK. It's their yeah. path. God bless them. You yeah. Know, right. and, and send them love. But but I don't have to, but my gut will let me know a lot of times, you know, and those are those, those reactions that, you know, okay, this person needs a lot more love. This person needs some understanding. Mm -hmm. And, and while I'm there, I'm just going to love them and understand them, but I don't have to own any of their stuff, you know? So, so I mean, so I'm, I'm working with my gut, my heart, my mind, and I'm trying to balance it all out at the same time. And it's, and when you start to live a more mindful life, um, you, it's really cool because you uh, you start to you know you start to recognize what type of information is coming from the heart, what kind of information is working with the mind, what works best with both, and where that coherence where does where is your coherence at this moment? Is it more mm-hmm. here? Is it more here? Is right. it down in the gut? You know where where is your where is your focus at this point? Right. You know, and so that really helps you in all kinds of situations because then you read your your um the circumstances that you're in mm-hmm. okay because we there's um there's these different um levels of awareness and like the awareness of being in unity okay well we right. can't live there because yeah. we can't pay our bills when we're living there okay <laughs> um so um it's a shame. but you also have uh, awareness of the circumstances that are around you Right. And and a lot of times when you start to live in a more mindful um, way, you're able to step back from the circumstances into a more empowered type of way of living, Mm -hmm. you know. So Mm -hmm. your consciousness then is is still a part of your physical being, but you've uh, detached yourself from the circumstances. Yeah. And and so that's where a lot of people that's where uh, you'll find uh, uh, a number of people that are really heavily into their spiritual path, that's where they're trying to reside, is in that, that space just outside of the circumstances. So right. that they can see the circumstances for what they are. They don't have to judge it from that point. Mm-hmm. You know, That's like what Spirit's trying to talk to us in that way with non-judgmental and to the point. Well, right. when you can step outside the circumstances, you're in that same realm. Okay. Right. Yeah. You're not you're not in the oneness. That's a whole nother level of awareness. Yes. But you're you're outside of the circumstances. And if we can achieve that, then we're we're you know, we're doing a good we're doing good. Yeah, really. <laughs> because, because now we're looking at life from an empowered point of view and we can and we can really focus on what we need to do and where we need to go. So I mean, and that's all different levels of awareness. And and so learning to discern where is the information coming? Is it coming through my heart, my mind, my gut? Mm-hmm. And then what are the circumstances and how can I apply what I'm receiving to my circumstances so to be you know, more, uh, more positive, more empowered, you know, right. and that sort of thing. Yeah. I wonder, um, when you had your NDE and you saw your life you had your life review and you um you saw the cancer did uh and knew that you were going to survive it did you see yourself here where you are now and uh, i'm just curious because it it's yeah. it's a a step it's a journey from engineer to to where you are right now i'm just curious if uh, if you saw that yeah it's interesting when i in the near death experience everything that i had lived Previous, prior to my NDE, um, was crystal clear. Oh my mm. God! You know, and and the interactions that I had with everybody was so crystal clear. And it was like my consciousness fragmented into these multiple streams of consciousness because I was experiencing it not only from my point of view but from everyone I'd ever interacted with from their point of view. Oh wow! So, 
So you can imagine. So there's this yeah. expansion of consciousness that we just can't experience here. It, it, mm-hmm. it, you know? Right. And and so, um, but then you reach that threshold where it's no longer your past; it's now your future. Mm-hmm. When you pass that threshold, suddenly it's like this corridor. You're looking down this corridor. Yeah. And there's a lot of core elements that are there that are very clear. Mm-hmm. But there's also this fringe stuff, not quite as clear. In my engineer mind, I had to kind of decipher <laughs> that. What does that mean? You know, like why was everything so crystal clear from my past and I could see all the ripples of the after effects of everything that I'd done in my life? Right. But then when I look to the future, I see things and some things are pretty clear. But then there's a lot of things that just are not as clear. Right. And what I what I finally determined, because uh, then eventually a lot of those things like the cancer came Mm -hmm. to being. Right. And and I got to see that and I got to live that and experience Mm -hmm. it in this physical realm, not just in that in that expanded awareness type Mm -hmm. of, of of feeling. And so what I began to believe or what I believe now is that there's this core corridor of potential okay mm-hmm. that that is that our consciousness resides in and so when we when we give an intention that okay i'm going to go to this direction right okay and we do that with loving intention then the universe says okay okay there's all this potential for him in that direction let's line it up Let's right. make it reality. But sometimes we may get a little too far off. So that's when spirit will say, up, up, up. You've gone too far that direction. Bring it back a little bit. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so then you may go off in this direction a little bit, you know, but that's okay. The universe is, oh, is so adaptable because all the potential exists right. at any moment. Yeah. All potentials exist at any moment because in the universe, actually time doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And so... Right. It's kind of neat that we're able to um, to look down this, and then when we when we're in the core of our path, you know, um, I do believe that you know we have multiple, we have a core path that we've agreed to when we came into this life, right? But we have the ability to kind of twist, you know, to weave our way down the path. In other words, mm-hmm. you know, and so I never believe that anyone's ever off their path. I right. believe that it's just it. That's the that's the um, that's the intention that you've set forth in your life to, and the universe is replying. You know. Yeah. Right. So it's very important how we view life. It's very important how we intend to live our life. It's very important on how much are we connected to our love? Are we connected to our our peace? Are we connected to those things? Because if 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 we're connected to that and we're living through our truth, our love, our peace, those empowering elements in our life, then that's what the universe is going to align for us. Right. Yeah. That beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I think that's actually a really uh, nice place for us to to wrap up. And uh, right. we can look forward to hearing more from you uh, yes. then on the live stream uh, next week. So um, thank you, uh, David Bennett, for being here with us today and just sharing a little bit about your journey and um, where you've come from and how you got to this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. It's great. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to look forward to seeing you uh, then next week. Yeah, I'll shake your hand. <laughs> awesome. I'll look forward to that, too. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. And that's David Bennett. And if you uh, enjoyed that and you uh, would like to see more, I, I'm really looking forward to his talk. Um uh, coming up next week. So then you can go to, um, oh, hang on. That's the wrong thing. You can go to this, uh, to streamingforthesoul.com and you can find tickets, uh, for the live stream and you can get more information about all the speakers and what the schedule is going to be. Um, and, uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. I think it's going to be a great conference and I think, uh, well, you'll just hear more things like what we talked about today. Um, you'll get to hear some more near death experiences. You'll get to hear from Suzanne Giesman, who is, 
a, a medium, and we're going to talk a little bit of quantum uh, electrodynamics too. So it's going to be a great conference, and we'd love to have you uh, join us on the live stream. And just remember, if you can't uh, do the live stream um, per the schedule, you have access to the video on demand for 90 days afterwards. So you don't really miss it. Um, you can just catch it on your own schedule. So thank you for being here today on uh, Superpowers. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you next time. And remember uh, to go out there and experience the extraordinary. <laughs>